Hello, listeners. Before we start, just a reminder for any Lepsters in London, there's a London Lepster meetup happening this coming Sunday, the 17th of November, 2019, from 2pm at the Fitzroy Tavern, 16 Charlotte Street, London, W1T2LY. I'm going to be in London this weekend, so I will be there too. Uh, along with Zdenek Lukas from Zdenek's English Podcast and various other Lepsters. So why don't you come and join us if you're in the area and meet some like-minded people and chat in English for a while. If you're planning to come, it would be good to let Zdenek know, just so that we have an idea of numbers. Send him an email at teacherzdenek at gmail.com. Teacher, you know how to spell. Zdenek is Z-D-E-N-E-K, teacherzdenek at gmail.com. Just send him an email just to let him know that you're coming. Hi, Zdenek, just letting you know I'm going to be there on Sunday. Looking forward to seeing everyone. All the best. And then your name. There's no entry fee. Uh, there's no specific program beyond just meeting and chatting in English. From 2pm, Sunday, 17th of November, Fitzroy Tavern, London, W1T2LY. Also, just before we begin, I'd like to recommend that you check out my sponsor, and that's italki. They're an online service with thousands of qualified native speakers who are ready to give you lessons or just conversations whenever you want them. It's very convenient because it's done using Skype or similar software, so you can basically have English lessons from the comfort of your own home based on your particular needs and your schedule. You sign up with italki, decide what kind of lessons or conversations you want, uh, browse the many available teachers and tutors, check out their qualifications, have a discounted sample lesson if you like, and when you buy some talking time, italki will send you a voucher for a free lesson. Go to teacherluke.co.uk slash talk to get started today. You're listening to Luke's English Podcast. For more information, visit teacherluke.co.uk. Hello and welcome to Luke's English Podcast number 625. This episode is all about British English slang. And this is part two of a little series, a probably a three-part series that I'm doing here about um, some language which I found in an article on the independent.co.uk. The article was called something like 88 English expressions that will confuse everyone. So what I've done is just focused on the bits of English that they are highlighting there as uh, examples of English slang that apparently will confuse everyone who kind of didn't grow up in the UK and all non-British people. And I think, um, you know, they're including Americans in that one as well, or anyone who speaks English out there in the world, uh, but who uh, wasn't sort of born and bred in the UK. So that's Americans, maybe Australians and other nationalities, and also, of course, learners of English who struggle with English slang and English idiomatic expressions and things like that. So this episode is all about helping you to understand some of the fairly common items of English slang and probably idiomatic language too. So let's continue going through this list of words from an article I found in The Independent. So here's the original link, which you can see on the page for the episode if you're looking at it on teacherluke.co.uk. Before we begin, I just want to give you a note on slang. So, um, you know, if you're learning English, uh, the question might be for you kind of, um, which language, which version of the language should I learn? Do I need to learn the slang? Should I be using slang? Well, I think really if you if you want to learn English properly, you've got to sort of be able to understand different styles, different registers. And certainly, and if you take, you know, exams like, you know, those Cambridge exams, they often will test your ability to sort of shift your style of English to fit the right situation. So it is about being adaptable and having some depth in your English, okay? Uh, so, you know, there is a grey area, really, between where slang uh, and colloquialism ends and sort of neutral English begins. Um, it's not quite as clearly defined as you might uh, expect or want. Um, so often, sometimes, our neutral situations, like at work, for example, you might be using 
some uh, bits of English that others might consider to be slang. It sort of depends on the situation. Uh, but I think it's good to know uh, some, some sort of, uh, to get some depth in your English vocabulary. So this is a look at some of the more informal English here. So every version of every language has slang and also cultural reference points that are unique to that language. English is no exception, of course, and because it's such a diverse language in terms of the number of different dialects it has, you know, around the world as a first language, it is quite possible for there to be slang in certain dialects that other speakers of the same language don't understand. For example, Americans might not understand certain things said in British English just because they haven't been exposed to it. I think probably the Brits are a bit more familiar with American slang just from TV and films and things. But even even then, there are bits of slang in the United States that are very local that uh, you might not get if your only exposure to the culture is through the, the, the popular culture stuff. For example, I had a conversation with uh, Jen from um, the uh, English Across the Pond podcast uh, a while ago, maybe about a year ago. And we did a slang test with each other to see how much slang we knew of each other's slang. And she knew more of my slang than I knew of hers. But I felt like hers was quite specific Los Angeles slang. Like, what was one of the expressions? To flip a bitch? Meaning to do a U-turn. Very obscure one I'd never heard before. But anyway, so it's possible for certain dialects... Uh, for you know there to be slang in certain dialects that other speakers of the same language don't understand for example americans not understanding things in british english or vice versa of course it's also difficult for learners of english to deal with slang it's not normally the language you encounter in the course books and so on and yet slang is very commonly used um, so a dialect of English like British English might be difficult to uh, to understand for anyone who wasn't born or, or grew up there. Slang is, uh, I think, important, um, you know, as I've said already, but it, it could just be you're trying to make friends with native English speakers from the UK and you're hanging around with them and they're using certain bits of language that, you know, you're not familiar with. Or maybe you're just watching TV shows, films and things from the UK or with British characters in them, and they're using bits of English that you kind of like, huh, what was that? What did that person say? I've got a few examples, actually, from TV and films, including stuff like Game of Thrones. Um, and what else have I got in there? I've got some Game of Thrones, and I've got some other things I can't remember right now. Uh, a film of some kind. Anyway, we'll see. So this stuff does come up in, in films and TV so- shows as well, of course. So you can use this episode uh, series to quickly learn uh, a, a whole world of slang, which will help you to understand and be understood by Brits more easily. And even if you're not planning to get chatting to some British people anytime soon, you can consider this series just to be a chance to kind of broaden your horizons as far as the English language is concerned and learn yet more of this precious vocab, because vocabulary probably is the most precious stuff of all. This is the difference often between intermediate English and advanced or proficient English, knowing how to adjust your style of English to meet various different situations. And, uh, you know, a range of vocab is vital for that. Uh, A knowledge of slang is essential, I think, in order to know all the possible light and shade in this language. As ever with these articles that, you know, crop up online, there are always a few little words or phrases that I kind of dispute or at least don't know. Uh, In the last episode, it was like the word dench, which neither my brother nor I use ever. And actually, I made several several edits to uh, the previous episode after initially releasing it. So if you've listened to that episode in the first 24 hours of it being released, you probably missed the edits. Basically, just a couple of little things with some comments that my brother sent me via text, basically saying that he thought dench wasn't wasn't a real word, but I think it's just not one that we use. It, there are some traces of it on the internet, but not a great deal. I think it's a real world word. I think it's a real word, but certainly not used in my particular circle. And the other one was like to to play a blinder, actually, not to pull a blinder. So anyway, let's see if there are similar words and phrases that I don't use perhaps because it's a regional thing and not said in my area growing up. As we go through the list, I'll let you know which ones I actually use and which ones I don't. And if you're using me as a model for the type of English you want to speak, then you can perhaps disregard any of the ones that I don't use. But of course, you should always be listening carefully to the English language as it is used. And if you spot any of these expressions being used on TV, in, in music, in films, or just in normal life, then that's worth noting. 
Also, I think that sometimes I use these expressions, but in a kind of knowing or ironic way. For example, if I called someone the bee's knees, I think I'd be doing it largely because I just like the sound of the expression. But knowing it's a bit old fashioned. It can be fun sometimes just to use these different expressions for a laugh as a way to add colour or humour to your speaking. So anyway, I'll also let you know if I think these expressions, if I use these expressions with a bit of irony. So I'll, you know, I'll give you the necessary information. In part one, I did 30 of these. Let's see if I can do the next 30 and then the final 28 in part three because this is 88 expressions. I'm going to have to be quick, so pay attention. You might have noticed already that I'm trying to speak quite quickly in this episode. Did you notice? I'm making an effort to try and speak fairly quickly. I'm going to try and go through the words, give you the information you need, and give some examples, and also maybe fool around, play around with my voice, and try and do some different things, but we will see. Uh, But I've got a lot to do, so let's start with the first one, which is the word faff, F-A-F-F. And really, I would say it's to faff or to faff around or faff about. If you've listened to all my phrasal verb episodes, then you will probably know this one. To faff or to faff around or faff about is basically to waste time doing nothing in particular, doing very little. Um, According to the article, faff comes from the 17th century word faffle, which means to flap about in the wind. So you can imagine a a flag would faffle in the wind, but that's an old word. We don't use it like that anymore. But faffing means kind of flapping about, you could say. So, you know, what, you know, what did you, what were you doing? We were just faffing around, just faffing about. Why were you late? Well, he just spent such a long time faffing around that, you know, we left the house really late. Uh, similarly, you could say faffing around, faffing about, messing around or messing about. And typically it would be something like, you know, stop faffing around. What are you doing? Stop faffing around. Come on, let's go. Right. Okay. Now I've, I've decided to add a few little questions uh, here with these words and phrases just to kind of let you practice maybe. I'm going to ask you some questions. You could, if you like, pause the podcast and actually say your answer out loud hopefully using the language that I'm teaching you. Uh, otherwise, you can just think your your responses. Or if you've got like a group of people who you're practicing your English with, you could use these questions just as a, as a little set of conversation pieces and a chance to, you know, repeat some of the words that you've heard on the podcast in this episode. So my questions here are, how much time in your typical day do you spend just faffing around? And what do you actually do when you faff around? So if I just use myself as an example, I think I probably start faffing around as soon as I, I get up, maybe even as soon as I wake up. The first, it's, it's, it's a pity to admit it, but actually the first thing I do when I wake up is probably lean over and check my phone. I've started putting it on flight mode these days when I'm asleep because I don't like the idea of having like a phone next to my bed that's active with the, you know all the signal and stuff. So I've put it on flight mode if that makes a difference. I expect someone will tell me it doesn't make any difference now. But so I take it off flight mode and I try to check my emails and stuff and just faff around on the internet, maybe for five to 10 minutes. And then, so that's the first bit of faffing done. Then I'll get up and there's, you know, unless I've prepared myself in advance, which I like to do these days, I like to just get all my my shirt, my trousers, my, you know, everything ready beforehand. But if I haven't done that, there's probably going to be time where I'm faffing around, I'm having a shower, I'm brushing my teeth, I'm getting distracted by something on YouTube and I'm trying to have my breakfast, you know, that's just sort of faffing around. And then I have to, then I sit down and eat my breakfast. And then there's usually some more faffing around where I'm kind of trying to find my British council ID cards. I'm trying to, you know, I'm getting my shoes on and then I can't find my keys. I'm faffing around. So that's how I faff around. What about you? How do you faff around? Let's move on to the next one, which is the word fag. And that a fag is a cigarette, which I think is probably an essential bit of English slang, British English slang, certainly. A fag is a cigarette. So where does this come from? According to the article, a fag end uh, is the uh, sort of tatty bits at the end of a reel of fabric. Is this, does this help? You know, sometimes when you, you kind of learn about a phrase and you learn the origin of the phrase, and I've said this before, often the origin story, the origin story of some of these words doesn't really help you learn the word, I think. Often you just have to just go, okay, a cigarette is a fag and that's it. And you just got to try and put those words together in your mind. 
The origin story takes you off on this weird little journey that doesn't really make sense. So a fag end is the is the is like the end of a roll of carpet. If you take a piece of carpet and roll it up, the end is going to be a bit raggedy. Those are the worst b- bits of the carpet, the the fag end. And historically, then cigarettes, the, these fags were a type of cigarette made from lower grade tobacco. But now the word fag just means all cigarettes. So does that story help you? I don't know. But um, in any case, a fag is a slang word for a cigarette in the UK. For example, can I scrounge a fag off you, please? You know, uh, if you've got a spare fag, can I borrow a fag off you? In American English, it means something entirely different, as you may know. In American English, a fag is it's a, a rude word, meaning a gay person. It's an extremely offensive word. Uh, to use. I'm going to add that here on the page for this episode. It's a gay person. Uh, Very offensive, um, offensive word. Okay, so watch out for that. For example, if you were in America and you said, excuse me, mate, can I bum a fag off you? They might be sort of confused at, at best. I think probably your best bet is they're going to be confused. They might, depending on where you are and who you're talking to, they may get violent with you or at least defensive. Excuse me, mate. Can I bum a fag off you? You want to you you want to bum a fag off me? You know, it's, it could be weird. So anyway, in the UK, excuse me, mate. You got a fag? You're like, if you if you want, imagine this. Here's a challenge for any of you in the UK at the moment. Any smokers living in the UK, especially in the sort of London area. Let's say next time you feel like you want a cigarette and you see a geezer on the street corner. Having a, having a cheeky little fag there on the street corner. What your, your challenge is, you've got to go up to him in your best Cockney voice. You've got to go, excuse me, mate, can I, uh, uh, what is it? What would he say? Excuse me, mate, can I, can I just, uh, can I scrounge a fag off you, mate? Can I scrounge a fag off you, please, mate? Mate, you've got to show your teeth when you say mate. Excuse me, mate, can I grab it? Can I uh, scrounge a fag off you, mate? I don't know what would happen. I mean, that's I say that as a challenge, but um, that could be very strange. I think actually, in all seriousness, if you wanted to get a cigarette from someone in the street, you'd probably say, excuse me, have you got a spare cigarette? Have you got a spare cigarette? But it's not very common for people to sort of blag cigarettes off strangers in the UK. I've seen, I see it happen in France quite a lot. There's constantly people going up to smokers, scrounging fags off them right but in england it doesn't happen that much so my challenge was sort of a joke okay Uh, but it could be interesting i wonder if you could learn to say excuse me mate like that instead of at least that that could be something you could have fun with right with your friends excuse me mate but it's got to be excuse me mate excuse me excuse me excuse me mate all right that's how you do your sort of Cockney London accent. Excuse me, mate. Excuse me, mate. All right. Okay. So a fag in the UK. What's the nickname that you give to cigarettes in your language? Do you have a nickname for cigarettes? Other related vocab here. You've got a fag butt, which is the end of a cigarette, the bit that you throw away. Fag butts all over the floor, for example. Uh, To stub out a cigarette or to put out a cigarette. To stub a cigarette out would be like to probably hold it with your fingers and squash it against an ashtray or against the floor or the wall or something to stub out a cigarette. Uh, And then you flick your fag butt, your cigarette butt onto the floor. Or if you're a good citizen, you make sure that it's extinguished and then you place it carefully into a a litter bin. Uh, other vocab, if, you wanna, if you've got a cigarette but you don't have a lighter, you can ask someone for a light. Excuse me, have you got a light? Have you got a light? Have you got a light? Okay, which reminds me of a joke uh, in a song by the Bonzo Dog Doodah Band. Okay, I'm going to play that joke to you now. Uh, the song is about a detective. It's one of those kind of, it's like a, 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 a joke version of like an American detective story. I was an American detective in New York and I had, you know, that kind of world of the American detective kind of thing. It's a sort of a joke version of that. But there's a little joke in here, which is just like maybe the first joke, one of the first jokes I ever was aware of, because my dad said this joke a few times when we were children and it comes from this song. So I'm just going to play a little bit of the song, see if you can identify 
the joke. We're taking a little joke tangent into joke town. Uh, can you spot and identify the joke? Have you got a light? It's in fact, okay, I'm going to have to help you. He says, have you got a light Mac? Mac is like a slang word for like mate in, in America in the fifties or something. Have you got a light Mac? It's like, have you got a light mate? Okay. That's the information you needed. I'm now going to let you listen to the clip. And can you spot the joke? I went home late, very late. What can I say to my wife? Darling, I've been beaten up again. Let's face it, she's credulous as hell. A punk stopped me on the street. He said, you got a light, Mac? I said, no, but I got a dark brown overcoat. Okay, so did you spot the joke? A punk stopped me in the street. He said, have you got a light, Mac? I said, no, but I've got a dark brown overcoat. Okay, so the joke... The joke is uh, uh, a Mac can be a uh, like a coat, an overcoat, a raincoat, a Mac, like a Macintosh, a Mac. So you can have a, a heavy Mac or you can have a light Mac. A light Mac would be a you know, thin overcoat that you'd wear if it was rainy, like the kind of thing that a, uh, you know, a, a detective in the 50s in America would wear, a light Mac. Uh, Columbo, I think, wore a light Mac. So have you got a light Mac? I mean, have you got a light mate, but also... Have you? Are you wearing? Uh, have you got a, a, a light uh, Macintosh overcoat? Have you got a light Mac? No, but I've got a dark brown overcoat. Okay, <sighs> okay. You'd live and learn, don't you? You do, or maybe you don't. Considering I just keep repeating, uh, I keep attempting to to tell jokes on this podcast without without any idea whether or not there's laughter occurring on the other side of the internet. Anyway, to, to a fag butt, to stub out a cigarette, to ask for a light, and a ciggy as well is another slang word for a cigarette, a ciggy. For some reason, I want to say that in a scouse voice. Excuse me, mate, have you got a ciggy? A ciggy? He's nicked all me ciggies. He's nicked all my cigarettes. <laughs> like, learn to speak scouse, episode one. Hey! Hey! <laughs> hey, you! Hey, you! Uh... You've nicked all my ciggies. You've stolen all of my cigarettes. You know, just the language that you would need in Liverpool. You know, this, this Luke's English podcast guide to speaking uh, like a scouser. That's a slightly unfair cliche of the scouse. But anyway, so let's move on to the word fit. Right now, the slang word fit. Oh, she's really fit, though, isn't she? You might hear someone saying right? I mean, it sounds creepy. Oh, she's really fit though, isn't she? Ooh. Okay. Right. So, um, fit means sexually attractive and, uh, it might be like hot these days. People are saying hot, you know, like she's really hot. She's so hot. He's so, you know, there's, there's a new hot guy at the office. What about, you know, you're about your English teacher. Is he hot? Everyone's hot, this hot, that right? But uh, also fit in the UK. For example, when I was a kid, when I was a a child at school, we all thought that our maths teacher was really fit. Okay. I don't know if she was objectively. I mean, you know, beauty is in the eye of the the beholder, right? So certainly for us, when we were 14, 15, for some reason, our maths teacher was really fit. She, you know, that can be attractive. I don't think it's because she was a maths teacher, although that is an attractive thing to a, a, a girl, a woman, a lady who um, understands, you know, multiplication, long division. <laughs> it's, it's starting to sound like, <laughs> it's starting to sound like a series of innuendos, don't you think? You know, she, I bet she's seen a few multiple divisions in her time, you know, she could, uh, I don't know. <laughs> you get the idea, right? Long multiplication. I'll tell you what, I'd like to multiply with her. You know, oh, I'm sorry, listeners. I'm sorry. Okay, Luke, bet, get serious. Okay, I'm sorry. Okay, it's all right. Anyway, when I was a kid, we used to think our maths teacher was fit. I mean, what about you? Have you ever been in a situation where you thought that a teacher or maybe a lecturer or professor or something at school or university was fit? Have you ever been in that situation? Again, I remember at university, uh, one of my housemates and me, we used to go to these lectures and there was a, 
a lecturer who was doing lectures about uh, film studies and she she was there was just i'm sorry she was fit uh, why are you apologizing luke it's okay to find women sexually attractive uh oh I, okay yeah it's fine i don't know why i'm apologizing for like outwardly saying that i thought someone was fit it's fine is that a British thing? I don't know. Anyway, uh, fit is used to describe someone who's physically attractive, especially referring to their physique, their body. For example, he's fit, she's fit, she's got a fit body. Obviously, it also means to be in good physical condition. Like if you go to the gym every day, you would be fit. You need to be fit to run a marathon. Okay, so that also is the word fit. But uh, the slang use of the word means uh, sexually attractive, hot. So what about you? What what uh, actor or actress do you think is quite fit or fit or really fit these days? Just off the top of my head, uh, yeah, just off the t- It's not like I was thinking about this all the time. But, uh, I mean, Scarlett Johansson, I think, is still really fit. She used to be. She still is. I mean, she's, uh, I mean, she's obviously in great shape, but she's still really hot i think well done luke you you're okay you didn't feel the need to apologize strange psychology suddenly at this moment Uh, it must be an english thing like an anglican protestant english thing you know maybe we're, we're a bit more reserved i don't know what it is Anyway, the next word is to flog something flog f l o g to flog something means to sell something Usually kind of quickly and cheaply, you'd like, if you've got some, like an old camera, you try and flog it somehow. For example, I'm trying to flog my old sofa. Do you know anyone that might be interested? I'm not actually trying to flog my sofa, just in case. <laughs> just in case anyone sends me an email. Don't email about the sofa. I'm not, fl- I'm, I need it for sitting on. I'm not flogging. Can I just clarify? I'm not flogging my sofa. Just an example. I'm trying to flog my old sofa. Do you know anyone that might be interested? Don't actually contact anyone who might be interested. You get the idea. What about you? What what, what is the last thing that you flogged? Can you remember the last thing that you flogged? Maybe on eBay or the equivalent in your country? I'm trying to think of the last thing I flogged. I flogged my old um, uh, audio recorder. I used to use a Zoom H4n for all the geeks out there. And I flogged it to a listener, uh, Guillaume from Guillaume's English podcast, which you might remember. Was it that? um, Yeah, that's the name of it. Haven't heard from him for a while. Are you still out there, Guillaume? Anyway, I flogged my Zoom to him and I think he's been using it to make videos and things. So uh, we also have a TV show called Flog It. Do you want to hear a little bit of Flog It? Flog It is classic uh, English daytime television. Okay, stuff that's on at like 2.30 in the afternoon on the BBC on a Tuesday, you know? And who's, who's watching TV at that time? It's, it's retired people, the elderly and students, okay? And the unemployed. Those are the people who are watching. And there's a lot of very sort of very cheaply made programs about ordinary people and ordinary stuff. And it's all so cheaply made. It's brilliant. It's almost like a work of art. And you just get to meet ordinary people like this. I'm going to just play you a little clip. See if you can make any, any sense of this. Possibly the most grotesque pair of earrings I've ever seen in my life. That's why we're trying to flog We agree. <laughs> oh, she used the word, ladies and gentlemen. What brilliant coincidence. Genuinely a coincidence. This is, I just picked a random spot in the middle of Flog It from 28th of May, 2018. And the girl said, that's why we're trying to flog it. So what they're looking at, basically the concept of the show is people come in um, and there are experts, antique experts, you know, experts in old things like old furniture and and jewellery and things. And the experts there are there and the members of the public come in with their items that they found in like storage. They found it in their loft. It's something their grandmother used to have and they bring it along because they want to sell it. They want to flog it. And they are curious to know if if it has any value. So they go and see the experts. The experts give them advice. And then I think afterwards the, the, the items are flogged or sold at auction. Okay, so in this case, we're looking at a pair of earrings, but they're really horrible, ugly looking earrings. They're like two little white hands is the best thing I could say to describe them. They're, they're not very attractive. They look kind of creepy, like these little little white hands maybe made out of marble or something like that 
and so he said i think these are the this these this is the most grotesque uh pair of earrings i've ever seen and she said that's why we're trying to flog it i mean no i don't want to offend you but that has to be possibly the most grotesque pair of earrings i've ever seen in my that's, life that's why we're trying to flog it. we agree <laughs> that's why we're trying to flog it we agree i mean that is perfect i serious i swear to god i didn't set that up i just found a place where they were talking about an item and she used the word okay so what's the last thing that you flogged um the full monty is the next one we're gonna have to hurry up okay come on right the full monty so the full monty does not refer to the film it, the full monty just means the the whole thing the entire thing with all the extras included for example if you're trying to choose an english uh fried breakfast the full english breakfast you might have various options on the menu but the proper full English breakfast with everything, with all the trimmings, you might refer to it as the full Monty. I'm going to go for the full Monty. I'm going to have the full English breakfast, please, with all the trimmings, meaning with like, you know, black pudding, with like extra fried bread on the side, with all the trimmings, please. Um, this is what was written on the page uh, on The Independent. They, they wrote, after the full Monty film was released in 1997. Do you know that film? It's a film about... Um, miners, I think, in the north of England who, l- when their coal mine closes down, they're forced to uh, work as strippers, male strippers, uh, just because, you know, their industry is closed down. So that it's all about the how that has affected their community and the sort of it's comical, it's funny, but it also has a sort of a softer side to it, which is basically these people are in desperate situations and they have to end up improvising and they end up becoming male strippers. That is the full Monty. I suppose it relates to the film in the sense that they've taken all of their clothes off. It's everything. It's the full Monty. So after the film was released, there was some, apparently, some international confusion over the phrase the full Monty, uh, in which it was taken as a euphemism for stripping, but it's, it doesn't mean stripping. However, the, the full Monty actually refers to pursuing something to the absolute limits. So the full Monty historically refers to an old tailor called Sir Montague Burton. Uh, going the full Monty after Sir Montague Burton, the famous old tailor, probably from Savile Row and in London. Going the full Monty meant purchasing a full three-piece suit, a three-piece suit, a shirt, and all of the trimmings, meaning like, you know, all the other bits and pieces that you would get along with a, a three-piece suit and a shirt. For example, our Christmas dinner had everything from sprouts to Yorkshire puddings. If you're going to have a roast, have the full Monty. All right, for example, I'm going to go for the full Monty. I'm going to have a full English breakfast. This is a phrase that I rarely use. I think maybe the only time I'd use it would be when I was ordering uh, a, a full English breakfast. I might say, yeah, I'll have the full Monty, please. Especially if that is the name of the breakfast on their menu, because it's actually quite common to, to see that written on a menu. The full Monty, meaning um, the the full English breakfast with all the trimmings. I'm sure I've seen it on a few menus. But don't be confused. If you do go into an English cafe and you see on the menu the full Monty, they're not selling DVDs. (laughs) Okay, let's move on to the next one. So uh, have you ever had a full English breakfast? Did you go for the full Monty? How about a Sunday roast? Did you go for the full Monty there as well with the Yorkshire pudding and everything? Next Phrases full of beans, like oh, you're 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 full of beans this morning, aren't you? Full of beans. It means someone that's energetic, lively, enthusiastic might be described as full of beans. Now, this phrase could be a reference to coffee beans, says the Independent. Uh, although these claims have been disputed, <laughs> as if there's like legal action. Uh, no, it's not coffee beans. It's baked beans. You know, in front of a judge. Order, order. The dispute over the origin of full of beans rages on, apparently. Anyway, beans, when you eat them, generally give you energy, right? They're a good source of energy. And they also give you gas. But anyway, um, so anyway, the meaning is pretty clear to me. If you're full of beans, you're full of energy. So, you know, so you're certainly full of beans this morning, aren't you? Okay. How do you feel right now? Do you feel full of beans or do you feel knackered? 
how do I'm writing this as you can tell how do you feel right now do you feel full of beans or are you feeling knackered spelt with a k okay moving on to the next uh, word that's the word gaff now if you want to sound like a cockney right this is one of those words that you've got to use right if you want to sound like a cockney geezer you've got to use this word all right where do you want to do it then do you want to do it your gaff my gaff so your gaff this is an informal word for a home your place my place your gaff my gaff is gaff er gaff their gaff our gaff whose gaff is it going to be some confused cockney could someone just tell me which gaff it is is it your gaff it's my gaff you know that kind of thing so it does sound cockney to me i think so for example what what are you up to this weekend we've got a party at our gaff if you fancy it we've got a party at our gaff we have we've got a party at our house at our place we've got a party we've got a party at our gaff and you're thinking what, what happened to all the consonants in that sentence we've got a party at our gaff party at our party at party at Party at our. That's party at our. We've got a party at our gaff. We've got a party at our gaff. How to speak Cockney. <laughs> Episode three. Gaff. House. We've got a party at our gaff. We've got a party at our house. You see? So I would use the word, but I'd only use it ironically, right? If I was trying to speak like a Cockney, right? Because I do that sometimes. It's just fun to just talk like a cockney in you know with close personal friends or if i'm on my own yeah little window into my strange uh, personal life there you can imagine me walking around so whose gaff is it whose gaff is it it's my gaff it's not your you know whose gaff is it it's our gaff i don't do that i've never done that but anyway have you ever seen eastenders it's a uh, a very well known sitcom set in east london and you know it's the sort of word that they would use it's the sort of word that they would use of a slight michael kane but not good enough to really go for it um what about peep show do you know the tv show peep show the word gaff came up in peep show i discovered it using the internet here we go all right all right all right all right, all right. so um this is from uh, series one episode six of peep show and uh i'm gonna blow this gaff wide open i'm gonna blow this gaff wide open difficult to explain that one i'm gonna blow this gaff wide open right i'm gonna blow this gaff wide open okay so this is what's his name it's simon or the other one i can't remember but anyway he's standing up it's at a funeral he's standing up he's obviously about to say something that's going to shock everyone and change everything. I'm going to blow this gaff wide open. I'm going to totally blow this up. I'm going to change everything with what I'm about to say. I'm going to blow this gaff wide open. I don't know the context beyond that. That's the only clip I've got. I'm going to blow this gaff wide open. So he's obviously going to say something that's going to shock everyone. Okay, meaning he's going to sort of blow the place apart, as it were. Okay, what about Veep, the American political sort of comedy drama what about that one let's see this is a clip been running this gaff for 25 years yeah. i've been running this gaff for 25 years so this is from an episode called the special relationship series three episode seven of veep and it's um i guess what's happening in this episode is the american vice president the vp uh the titular veep in this sh- in the show the eponymous veep is um uh, in the UK, speaking to a guy who runs a pub, and he said, "I've been running this gaff for twenty-five years." Yeah, I've been running this gaff for twenty-five years. Yeah. I've been running this gaff for twenty-five years. I've been running this pub for twenty-five years. All right then. So, what about Layer Cake, the film with um, Daniel Craig in it, James Bond himself before he became James Bond? Um, we've got the gaff is rotten in there. So you hear the actor Dexter Fletcher saying, "Before you go in." I think he says something like, before you go in, the gaff is rotten in there, meaning the room stinks. So this is like a crime thriller. So I imagine the room stinks because there's a dead body in the room. So it's like, you know, before you go in, there's a, the gaff is rotten in there. Let's let's hear that. Rick, well, I've got to tell you, the gaff is rotten in there. 
I've got to tell you, the gaff is rotten in there. So Dexter Fletcher, right, speaks a bit like this. He's got a kind of a Cockney accent. Quick. Well, I've got to tell you, the gaff is rotten in there. I've got to tell you, I've got to, I've got to, I've got to tell you, I've got to tell you, the gaff is rotten in there. The gaff is rotten in there. And who could forget, of course, the classic, cult classic with Nail and I, Danny, the drug dealer, says, do you realise this gaff is overrun with rodents? Do you realise that this gaff, like your house, is overrun with rodents, meaning there are rats living in this place? I think it's, you do, re- do you realise this gaff's overwhelmed with rodents? That's it, in Danny's, uh, like, unique accent. Do you realise this gaff's overrun with rodents? When I come in, do you realise this gaff's overrun with rodents? Do you realise this gaff's overrun with rodents? Because that's how Daddy, the drug dealer, speaks in with Nail and I. If you don't know what With Nail and I is, then you can check out an episode I did all about it. Um, With Nail and I Film Club uh, Teacher Luke. That's how I'm going to Google this. It's episode 497, With Nail and I, the episode of Film Club, where you can learn all about this classic uh, English cult comedy. It's a brilliant film. The next is the word gallivanting. Gallivanting. G A L L L I V A N T I N G. Gallivanting. So to gallivant or to go gallivanting. Um, hmm. So, all right, let's see what the independent says. So they, they say, uh, or they said that to gallivant means to roam, to move around, like travel around, or to set off on an expedition with the sole intention of having some light hearted fun. So it's, da-da-da-da-da, we're going to go gallivanting. I imagine someone skipping through a forest or a hilly meadow. A carefree adventure. Skipping through the wilderness, you know, gallivanting off in the countryside. For example, this is not from Pirates of the Caribbean, but it could be. You're supposed to stay and be a princess, not go gallivanting after pirates. So he's saying to the princess, you've got to stay here and be a princess and all that. You can't go off on some fun adventure. You can't go off gallivanting after pirates. And um, Game of Thrones, this one turned up. I'm going to gallivant right over. Now, I don't know the context of it because I, this is a search engine that I've found on the internet called Yarn. It's getyarn.io. And basically, it allows you to search for tiny clips of certain words. And I just type in the word gallivanting. And one of the things I found was this from Game of Thrones. And I'm going to gallivant right over. And I'm going to gallivant right over. And I'm going to gallivant right over. Right. So apparently that's from Series 6, Episode 5. I'm going to gallivant right over. I don't even know who the character is. I don't know Game of Thrones. But Game of Thrones fans, you might be going, oh, my God, at this point. So, another example. Off they go again, gallivanting. Now, I I would only use this expression in a kind of sarcastic way in order to maybe complain about someone doing other things when they should be focusing on something more serious. So, when someone's off, like, doing something fun, maybe traveling or something, when they should be doing something serious, I would say, you know, he's off gallivanting around southern Europe. For example, off he goes, gallivanting around the south of France when he should be at home sorting out all the problems. I wonder who that would refer to. The next word is the word geezer. Now you might have heard me you might have heard me use the word geezer when I'm speaking in a when I'm speaking. Right, I've got to get my Cockney accent right. You might have heard me use the word geezer when I'm speaking in a Cockney voice. A geezer is a man that could be described as well. Apparently, right, according to the independent they think a geezer is a man that could be described as like stylish suave chic dapper and is often suited and booted meaning you know in a nice suit men from east london are also commonly referred to as geezers for me a geezer is just a man a geezer um is a slang word for a man like a bloke right that's that's how i see it i think cockneys use the word geezer meaning man you know, like, you know, um, yeah, so like this geezer, right, he comes in, he, he comes up to me, right, and he goes, excuse me, mate, can I scrounge a fag off you? And I thought, are you take, are you mugging me off? Are you trying to copy my voice? Are you trying to copy my accent? Are you mugging me off in front of my friends? Something like that. 
some a geezer, a story about a geezer. Um, yeah, all right. So there you go. For example, that guy's got such swagger. He's a proper geezer. I think in Manchester they use it. I can imagine like like, like Liam Gallagher like using that as well. Like fucking proper geezer. I tell you what, right? Fucking John Lennon. You know what I mean? Proper geezer. You know what I mean? You know, like a uh, who who are your who are your heroes? Fucking John Lennon, man. He's a fucking geezer. That's my Liam Gallagher impression. Whereas Noel, Noel's more like this. You know what I mean? Like Noel's. The thing about Noel is he's got he's got a story right for everything. You know what I mean? And he says, you know what I mean? At the end of everything he says, you know what I mean? Sort of like that. So the thing about our kid is, you know what I mean? He's just he's he's fucking he's mental. You know what I mean? He's stylish as fuck, but fucking mental. That's 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 uh, that's fucking Noel. And Liam's like fucking all right, a lot more. Fucking monosyllabic. Oh, I fucking, I'm mad for it, me. Okay, that is Noel and Liam Gallagher from the rock band Oasis. Preparing an episode about them soon, hopefully. So, all right, geezer. Look at this geezer. Right, I'm fucking mad for it, me. I'm fucking mad for it. All right. Uh, oh, that's Liam Gallagher's brain stopping. So I used to use uh, this word uh, quite a lot. So I used to, I didn't used to, I just use, I misread my own sentence. I use this one quite a lot, although it does sound quite cockney. Other regional accents use it too. You could also say bloke, all right? It's like this, you know, look at that bloke, look at that geezer, look at that geezer. It does sound cockney though, doesn't it? Look at that geezer over there, for example. Okay, moving on to the next one. Give me a tinkle on the blower. Give me a tinkle on the blower. Now, this is exactly the sort of thing that the Americans hear and then they take it and they and they take the piss out of us with it. Because every time you hear an American doing an English accent, it's all this kind of like, oh, go blimey, governor. You know, give me a tinkle on the blower. It's all that kind of bollocks. You know, just using all this sort of apparently antiquated, uh, quaint, cute language that we don't actually use. It's like, oh, you know, have another, oh, oh, go blimey, governor, it's tea time. Quick gizz a tinkle on the blower. And they can't say, can't say like blower. So it's like, give us, gizz a tinkle on the blower. They can't do it properly. Anyway, gizz a, give me a tinkle on the blower. I never use this, all right? I just never, ever say this. It means give me a call or ring me on the telephone, right? The phrase is sometimes shortened to give me a tinkle. Tinka, 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 tink. That's a tinkle. Tinkle refers to a phone's ring, while blower is slang for telephone. And it refers to the device that predated telephones on naval ships, of course. It, uh, half of our language comes from stuff that people did on ships. Anyway, sailors would blow down a pipe to their recipient, where a whistle at the end of the pipe would spark would sound to spark attention. <laughs> so you blow down the pipe, blow the whistle, uh, a tinkle is the ring, ringing sound. Basically, just call me on the telephone. Give me a tinkle on the blower, but I never say it. There you go. It is what it is. Thanks, independent.co.uk. Let's move on to gobsmacked. Gobsmacked, like, oh my God. Like, when you're so shocked and amazed and astounded that you slap your face and hold your the palm of your hand against your cheek or your chin <gasps> with your mouth open. Ah. Uh, Oh my God, like that. They think of like Macaulay Culkin when he, I guess, is it when he realises that he's been left home alone or is it when he slaps um, his brother's deodorant on his face or something, but ah, like that, surprised, astounded, bewildered, shocked. Your gob is your mouth. It's a slang word for your mouth. Shut your gob means shut your mouth. So gob smacked means you you smacked your face in shock. Okay, I was absolutely gobsmacked. This is a good word which everybody should know. So there you go. When was the last time you were gobsmacked? I mean, it doesn't happen all the time, but I think it happens when you're watching a really good TV show or film, right? Like when you have one of those, oh my God, moments. Have you ever felt gobsmacked while watching a film or TV show? Like, for example, when a character dies unexpectedly. Oh my God, I can't believe they killed him. I was gobsmacked. We don't say gobsmacking. We don't say that was gobsmacking. It's only the ED version. I was gobsmacked. Or you, were. anyone could be gobsmacked. It's, it's not just me. It's like Luke was gobsmacked. You can be gobsmacked too, if you want. 
Uh, next is the word gutted, which um, you you must know by now if you've been listening to this podcast for any length of time. I was absolutely gutted. Um, it means very disappointed uh, or devastated, extremely upset. Very Like when England lost the football match, I was gutted, said like a, a guy who was pretending to be a football fan. I tell you what, lads, uh, when England won, uh, lost the football game, I was really gutted. Um, sounds like someone who's trying to sound like a football fan. Anyway, but if you use gutted, it you know, it's fine. It's a fine word. It's slang, of course. I'm absolutely gutted. Uh, not to be confused with literally being disemboweled because your guts are actually your intestines. And if you're gutted, it means all your, your intestines are pulled out, which doesn't happen to people very often, I hope. But we do it to animals. We do it to fish, don't we, before we cook them. We, we gut the fish. So the fish is gutted. So if you are gutted, well, literally, it means all your, your entrails have been removed. But um, actually, it means to be very disappointed. And it's it's not a violent, disgusting expression when you when we use it. It just means very disappointed. So I was absolutely gutted. Like, you know, how do you feel after England lost uh, another football game on penalties? Well, obviously I'm gutted, aren't I? I'm absolutely gutted. I can't think of a better example than that at the moment. Uh, gutted is one of the most common and recognisable bits of uh, British slang. Uh, along with knackered and ch- and chuffed. Knackered meaning tired, chuffed meaning pleased, and gutted meaning disappointed. So here's a question. I was trying to think of a question that I could ask you that would allow you to use this word. And I'm not sure this question is really the right one, but I'm using it anyway. So how would you feel if you were invited onto Luke's English podcast? Like if I invited you, randomly invited you, unprepared, onto an episode of Luke's English podcast, how would you feel? Would you feel gutted or would you feel chuffed now i imagine that you would feel chuffed but some of you might feel gutted because you'd think like oh god i'm not ready uh this is going to be embarrassing or something uh but hopefully you would be chuffed rather than gutted let's move on to how many more have i got one two three four five six seven four eight nine ten eleven oh my god twelve shit thirteen fourteen fifteen sixteen is that it? 17, 18. Oh my God, I've got 18 more. Come on. Right, I've got to. Re- I've got most of them to come. Right, I've got to get a move on. This is going to be very quick from now on, okay? Come on, let's do this. Okay, so where were we? Uh, gutted. Right, next one is half past. So we're talking about the time when Americans are more likely to say 7.30, 7.30 or 5.50 in an American accent. Brits will more often than not use... Uh, uh, that we will refer to times in minutes past or minutes are uh, minutes two. I, to be honest, we use the other one as well. So we'd say three thirty as well, but sometimes we say half past three. For example, at half past seven, ten to six. It's unclear why Brits appear to favour analog time telling sometimes, while Americans go for the digital format. I've, I've also added we don't really do that much so much anymore. You might find people doing it in England more than in America. For example, it's 20 past 11, which is another way of saying it's 11.20. So a quick rule of thumb for this, if you're wondering, when do we say past? When do we say two? So if you look at a clock, divide the clock in half vertically, right? The, the, the right-hand side of the clock, that's past, including uh, half, half past. So five past, 10 past, quarter past. 20 past, 25 past, and half past. Then all the other ones on the other side are two. 25 to, 22, quarter to, 10 to, 5 to, and so on. So here's a quick quiz. Can you say these times in the British way? For example, 110. 1.10. It's 10 past 1. 2.15. It's, and don't forget the it's, a quarter past 2, or it's quarter past 2. 3.20 would be it's 20 past three. 425 would be it's 25 past four. 530, it's half past five. 635 would be it's 25 to seven. 740 would be it's 20 to eight. 845 is it's a quarter to nine. 950 is it's 10 to 10. And 1055 is it's five to 11. OK, now sometimes those are abbreviated to half past. Like, what time is it? It's just coming up to half past or it's just gone quarter past. 
It's just coming up to half past means it's nearly half past. It's just gone quarter two means uh, it it was quarter two just a moment ago. So questions. What time do you get up? What time, do you, what time did you start listening to this? What time do you go to bed usually? And what time does your lunch end? See if you can use the sort of British way of doing it. Although we don't always do it like that in the UK. Next is the word Hank Marvin. Hank Marvin was a guitarist in, and I think he's still alive. Uh, don't have time for this, but I'm going to Google it. Hank Marvin. Hank Marvin is. Okay, so he's still alive. Um, he is an English multi-instrumentalist uh, and songwriter. Basically, he's most famous for being the guitarist in a group called The Shadows. The Shadows were incredibly in- uh, influential. They did instrumental guitar music in the early 60s. And it was a bit like American surf guitar rock music, rock and roll music, but uh, with a slightly sort of British flavour. Hank Marvin was a great guitarist. He used lots of guitar effects. And so Hank Marvin is someone that we all know. He's a household name. And also Hank Marvin is Cockney rhyming slang. What do you think it's Cockney rhyming slang for? I'm absolutely Hank Marvin is starving, meaning very hungry. So I'm Hank Marvin means I'm hungry or I'm ravenous or I'm starving hungry. Um, Okay. So, for example, when are we going to eat? I'm Hank Marvin or I'm absolutely... um, Hank Marvin. I have to be honest, I do use this one. I like this one. Maybe because I'm a music fan, but I just like saying I'm Hank Marvin to mean uh, I'm hungry. And my wife has learned to understand it and maybe tolerate it too. So how are you feeling right now? Are you feeling, so from one end of the spectrum, full, meaning you've just eaten, to the other end of the spectrum, you're Hank Marvin, meaning you're really hungry. So how are you right now? Are you full? Are you stuffed? Are you fine? Are you a bit peckish? Are you hungry or are you absolutely Hank Marvin? Moving on to the next one is in it, in it, I-N-N-I-T. So in it is actually an abbreviation of isn't it and uh, is most commonly used uh, by sort of teenagers, young people. Uh, You can add it as a tag question on the end of a sentence, no matter what the auxiliary verb is. So technically it's incorrect English, but people do put in it at the end of any sentence. It doesn't matter what the proper uh, tag question should be. It doesn't matter. So, for example, he hasn't done his homework in it. Or what would be more likely, he ain't done his homework in it. He ain't done his homework in it, for example. Sounds terrible when I say it. You ain't done your homework in it. Imagine if I said that to my students one day. All right, so, like, you, you ain't done your homework in it. I can tell you, you don't know, you doesn't know the answers. That sounds awful when I do it. Mm, I'm not really in the zone for doing voices today. Anyway, so you might say it's really, it's really cold in it. Uh, and also it's sometimes used as a response, as a way to agree or confirm. It's really cold today in it though. In it though, meaning it is, isn't it? So again, this is sort of quote unquote incorrect or bad English, but there it is. You, you will hear it. It's really cold in it. It's it's cold today. It's so cold today in it though. We also use is it. Although I never do this. Um uh is it as a way to show surprise. Like my mum won the lottery. Is it? But I wouldn't say that. It might be like, yo, is it fam? My yo uh um it's it sounds weird me doing certain accents, it's uncomfortable, but it's like, yo, my mum won the lottery, is it fam? Meaning like, did she? Anyway, I do use in it quite a lot, but I'm using it sort of ironically, meaning I know I'm not the normal type of person who uses it. I'm kind of imitating Ali G in it. Right, moving on. Leg it. Leg it. Yes, leg it. And this means run. Leg it. It's the cops. Leg it. Here are the police. Run away. Run away. Make a run for it. Scarper. All words meaning run for it, run away, leg it. So, for example, yeah, you know, that's when all the lights came on, so we legged it. Like someone describing a story of breaking into some building they weren't supposed to be in. Yeah, we were in there and then the lights came on, so we legged it. We used to say this all the time when we were children, you know, quick, leg it. (laughs) He's coming, leg it. You know, it's the thing you say when you want to shout, run. Instead, you go, leg it. Yeah. 
So, moving on. Long. Now, I never say this. Long. Yes, like a long episode. Long. I never actually say this. And if I did, it would be embarrassing. It's the sort of thing I would hear from like school kids on the bus in London. The same people who would probably say, in it, is it, and blood and fam and all that kind of thing. And maybe dench as well. Anyway, something that takes a lot of effort and probably probably isn't going to be worth all of the effort either could be described as long. So something that takes a lot of effort and long time and it's not worth it is long. Yo, doing the washing up is long, fam. Like doing the washing up is really annoying and it takes ages. Okay, so this could be due to the length that the person will have to go in order to complete the task. Something that's long is probably also annoying and aggravating. And you have to emphasize it. Yo, cleaning the kitchen is long, fam. Again, it's it's a bit weird for me to like copy that specific accent. Is it normal for like a white middle class guy with my accent to copy the accent of like probably a young black person in a, in a rough part of London? I don't know. But anyway, I'm just trying to demonstrate language to you. I'm not trying to. It's all right, Luke. It's OK. Carry on. It's difficult for some reason today, you know, trawling through the, the cultural complexities of English slang. Right. Lurgy. We're on safe ground with this one. The lurgy. It's actually the lurgy. Uh, if someone's got the lurgy or caught the lurgy, it means they're suffering from cold or flu-like symptoms. I've got the lurgy. Like, where's where's Mike? Oh, he's got the lurgy. He's in bed with the lurgy. Okay. Um, so lurgy maybe comes from the word allergy, but uh, it's not sure. I would just say lurgy just means like having a cold or having the flu. You've got the lurgy. It's just a generic sort of uh, generic illness, probably a a, um, a virus like flu or the cold or a cold. She's come down with the dreaded lurgy. The dreaded lurgy is quite good. So I hate getting the lurgy. It's the worst. Usually you feel it at the back of your throat. It's like a little tickle or a cough at the back of your throat. Then your nose gets all blocked up. Then you get a headache and you feel all stuffed up and you might get aches and pains. Oh, it's the worst. I hate getting the lurgy. And then you get a runny nose and you're coughing and spluttering. It's the worst. So what about you? When was the last time you got the lurgy? Did you take time off work or college? How do you protect yourself from the lurgy? And what is a good cure for the lurgy? Right. Now, the next item in the list is simply this, making random words past tense to mean drunk. Take a random word, put it in the past tense, it means drunk. So, according to the Independent, Brits are known for favouring a drink or two, meaning we like to, we like to piss it up a bit, don't we? So much so that almost any noun can be used as a substitute for drunk. Okay, so I was, you know, what I was absolutely podcasted. (laughs) <laughs> no one's ever said that i think but anyway you got examples of like i was trolleyed a trolley like a shopping trolley that you have in the supermarket i was absolutely trolleyed i was smashed i mean smash is a verb anyway i was gazeboed a gazebo mm. a gazebo is what a kind of a tent it's a sort of a, a temporary tent that you'd put up in the garden to Protect yourself from the sun or the rain. A gazebo. Okay. I was absolutely gazeboed. I was absolutely trolleyed. Here's Michael McIntyre, uh, the comedian, British comedian, who says that you can actually use any word in the English language and substitute it to mean drunk, and it works. But only if you're posh, apparently. So here's what he says. Getting drunk. Or as posh people, posh people have a variety of words for, po- for drunk. You can, have, uh, you can be wellied or trousered or arseholed. Wellied. Wellies are Wellington boots, those rubber boots that you might wear if it's raining. Wellied. Trousered. Well, you know, your trousers, the things you might be wearing on your legs. Arseholed. Your arsehole, yes, is your, your bum hole where... Yeah, you get the idea. Um, I was rat arsed. <laughs> I was rat arsed. Yeah, the arse of a rat. I was rat arsed. You can actually use any word in the English language and substitute it to mean drunk as a posh person. It works. Did you have a drink last night? You're joking. I was utterly gazeboed. It fits. <laughs> You're planning on having a drink? Are you joking? I'm going to get totally and utterly car parked. You can say it. I mean. I'm going to get totally and utterly car parked. 
you can play. Okay, you get the idea. We don't have time to, to hang around, so let's keep moving. The video for that is on the page for the episode. If you want to check it out, there's about 30 seconds more of Michael McIntyre being funny and laughing at his own jokes as well a little bit. Um, so uh, I was absolutely car parked. So what about you? Do you do the same thing in your language? Do you, I mean, not get drunk, but I mean, do you use various words to describe being drunk? The next word is miffed. Oh, to be honest, I was, I was a bit miffed. I was a bit miffed. It's always a bit miffed. And it means slightly irritated, slightly annoyed. Mm. Like, yeah, we couldn't get in, you know, we, well, we could, we had to stand at the back for the whole show. I was a bit miffed, to be honest. So if you're miffed, it, it, it means, you know, you're just a bit annoyed. I was a bit, I was a bit miffed. I can't lie. For example, so over to you, when was the last time you felt a bit miffed? And what happened? I'm trying to think of the last time I felt a bit miffed. Um, well, the you know, last time I got Q jumped, which happens all the time, as you know, but I get very miffed when someone jumps ahead of me in the queue. I really can't stand it at all. Minging is the next word. Minging. M-I-N-G-I-N-G. Not a nice word. Something is minging if it's disgusting, unpleasant, unappetizing, or highly unattractive. Minging. Absolutely minging. Apparently, the term comes from the Scottish slang word ming, which means feces or poo. Uh, so minging actually means shitty. So what's in that sandwich? Is that ham and tuna? That is absolutely minging. Uh, like a really disgusting sandwich. It's also rude uh, to say it, but sometimes people use the word to describe an ugly person, especially an ugly woman. But that is not very nice at all. Like your sister is well minging in it. I don't know why I did it in that voice. Your sister's minging. <laughs> I don't know why you would say that. Maybe if your friend had a very ugly sister and you thought it was necessary to point it out. Your sister is minging. Like, th- thanks. Fuck off. Next is the word mint. I think I've bitten off more than I can chew in this episode because I'm going too quickly. Mint is the word mint. If something is mint, it means it's really top quality, really, really nice, in really good condition. It's probably derived from the expression mint condition, meaning something that is in perfect condition. Like, you know, my, um, my, uh, <laughs> my, ro- I have a Rolls Royce and it is in mint condition. You're not to drive it. Don't even touch it. You're not even allowed to look at it. It's in mint condition. Okay. So in perfect condition, but we also use the word mint meaning something that's just in really good quality and in good condition. Like if you buy some new shoes, like those new shoes are mint. Um, I don't use it very often. I might say, if if I'm looking for an example, like my new Dr. Martins are mint. I bought some new Doc Martins, uh, the made in England ones, because, you know, I'm trying to uh, help out the community. Um, But they are mint. They are brand new and they look great. Um, Right. Mortal. Now, I never use this one. We could probably skip through it quickly. Apparently, mortal is a word that's used in the north east of England, meaning drunk. And I think it came into popularity from a TV show called Geordie Short, which is like a reality show featuring Geordies from the Newcastle area. And, um, you know, mortal, mortal or mortal means someone who's really drunk. So we've had all those other words like bladdered and badgered and gazeboed and ta- uh, taxi trolleyed um uh mortal as well apparently did you see scott last night he was mortal meaning he was really drunk the next word is nick in the nick to get nicked or to nick something okay now if you're in the nick it means you're in prison all right in prison uh, to get nicked means to get um arrested and to nick something is to steal something. Got it? So the nick can refer to prison, while to nick something means to steal something. Um, Okay, so did you just nick that? Like you just come out of a shop and your friend is holding uh, an item, a banana. Like, did you just nick nick that banana? Oh, never mind. No one's going to notice. And then he eats the banana and then policeman's hand arrives on his shoulder excuse me young man (laughs) did you pay for that banana uh oh sorry officer right you're nicked get in the back of the van so if you if you nick that you'll get caught or you'll end up in the nick you'll get nicked all right there you go to get nicked and to, to nick something and to end up in the nick 
here's an example a terrible accent by Don Cheadle, the American actor who is in the film Ocean's Eleven. This is a famous um, uh, performance because this is Don Cheadle trying to do a Cockney English accent and not doing a very good job. And what does he say? He says, "That's a great al- That's a great idea, Albert. Let's all get nicked." Su- saying to someone like sarcastically, "That's a bad idea. If we do that, we'll be arrested." Yeah, that's a great idea, Albert. Let's all get nicked. That's a great idea, Albert. Let's all get nicked, he should be saying. Oh, no, that's a great idea, Albert. Let's hop out the van and we can all get nicked. Let's hop out the van and we can all get nicked. So let's hop out the van. They're in a van. Let's hop out the van. Let's hop out of the van and we can all get nicked. That's a great idea, Albert. We can hop out the van and we can all get nicked. But uh, we can hop out the van and we can all get nicked. But he says it. That's a great idea, Al. Let's all hop out the van or something like that. Oh, no, that's a great idea, Al. But let's hop out the van and we can all get nicked. Let's hop out the van and we can all get nicked. Mm. It's a famous performance, famously bad accent. Anyway, uh, have you ever got nicked? I have. I got nicked once. It wasn't serious. I don't have a criminal record, but I got nicked for skateboarding in a place where I shouldn't have been skateboarding. I was about 12 years old at the time. And you can hear all about it in at least one episode of the podcast, Luke and Andy's Crime Stories, which is episode 45, way back from probably 2010, I would, I, I expect. The next one is one that I don't really use. Well, I use half of it. And that is the expression, I'm on it. Okay, I'm on it like a car bonnet. Okay, now I wouldn't use the like a car bonnet part. So I've actually never heard or used I'm on it like a car bonnet, but I have definitely used I'm on it. Okay, so I'm on it is definitely a phrase. It means I'm I'm doing it. I've got it under control. I'm responsible for it. For example, how's the report going, Steve? Don't worry, Alan. I'm on it like a car bonnet. Ah, not like a car bonnet. Don't worry, Alan. I'm on it. I'm on it. I'll take care of it. Don't worry. I'm on it. How about that report? Don't worry, I'm on it. Meaning I've got it under control. Mm. But if you said, don't worry, I'm on it like a car bonnet, Alan. Alan might say, "Mm." hmm. It would have been all right if he hadn't said like a car bonnet at the end. But um, he did, so he's going to have to go. Uh, And then, you know, Alan says, Steve, can I have a... Is it Steve? Steve, can I have a word with you? Yeah, sure. What is it? Well, look, uh, the problem is I'm going to have to let you go. Uh, oh, what, what's what, what's the matter? Well, it's just you use that phrase on it like a car bonnet, and that kind of language just will not be tolerated. I'm sorry. Uh, get your coat. Why do I? Why am I saying this? Well, on it like a car bonnet is a cheesy expression that I don't think people use that much. A car bonnet. Well, in the last episode, we had the boot of the car, didn't we? Do you remember? Uh, in this one, we've got the bonnet of the car, which is what you open. The, the front of the car, you would open it to see the engine. So it's the bonnet. So I suppose it's worth learning that, the bonnet of the car. But I wouldn't say I'm on it like a car bonnet. I would just say I'm on it. Don't worry about it. I'm on it. Okay. On the pull. On the pull. Now, if you're on the pull, it means you've gone out for a night out, probably with the intention of finding or attracting a sexual partner. So if you're on the pull, if you're a lad, you're probably out there, uh, you know, if you're one of those sorts of lads like Dave, you're out on the pull, you're trying to find a girl to get off with, all right? So pull can also be a verb. If you pull, it means you've you've kissed someone or you've found someone, you found a mate for the evening, you've pulled, like, oh, look at Dave, he's pulled. Uh, did you pull last night, for example? All right, so to be on the pull, like, you know, to go out on the pull, and then if you're lucky, you will pull. Did you pull last night? And, you know, like you might go up to, I don't know, would a girl say this? I think, you know, it's in the culture, but there is this phrase, get your coat, you've pulled. So if a girl went up to a guy and said, oi, get your coat, you've pulled, it means come with me, let's go and uh, have it off with each other. Uh, also, we've got so we've got on the pull. We also have on the lash, which I think is appropriate because you often might do the same thing at the same time. If you're on the lash, it means you've gone out to get drunk. So you might be on the lash and on the pull at the same time. 
Next one is the phrase to over egg the pudding. Over egging the pudding means embellishing or, or doing something too much. Like, for example, if I'm giving an example of the word brolly and I keep repeating like, oh, do you want to be sure you don't want a brolly like over and over again? It's like, all right, Luke, don't over egg the pudding. OK, so it's sort of going over the top, basically. Um, all right. So, OK, so it just means going too far, doing too much, pushing a situation to the max. But it is said in a pejorative and a disdainful, critical way, like don't over egg the pudding, Luke, for example. OK, um, so, you know, oh, yeah, we get it. You've injured yourself. Don't over egg the pudding. Like someone who's complaining a lot about, oh, oh my poor, my poor, um, uh, my poor what would it be? Little finger. Oh, my poor little finger. All right. Don't over egg the pudding. We get it. Um, so what do you think? Do you think they over egg the pudding at the end of the Avengers Endgame film? Too many superheroes. Did they over egg the pudding there? What do you think? Next is the word pants. Absolute pants. Total pants. Pants means rubbish, trash, garbage. I mean, something is of poor quality. Okay. So that film was pants, wasn't it? That is, this is pants. Let's go. Okay. Like if you're in in a theater and the, the, the play is rubbish and you lean over to your friend, this is pants, isn't it? Let, should we go? Let's go to the pub. Do you fancy a pint? Total pants. What do you think of the film? It was oh, total pants, which is what I hope that I'm not going to say when I come out of the new Star Wars film. I'm concerned, of course, but hopefully it won't be total pants. It might be a little bit pants, but I can tolerate a little bit of pants. But as long as it's not total pants, I'll be all right. Here's an example dialogue uh, with some funny elements to it. He said with a dry tone to his voice. How was the film? Pants. Uh, what about the match? Uh, pants. How was England's performance? It was pants. What about the pub where they showed the game? Yeah, pants. What about the beer? That was pants as well. How about your pants? They're pants. What, your pants are pants? No, actually, my pants are great. They're the only thing that isn't pants. My pants. That's ironic, isn't it, that your pants are great, but everything else is pants. But pants not meaning great. Okay, I'm already over-egging the pudding. You get the idea. Pants is, you know, bad, right? I think it's because pants in general are bad. But my pants just happen to be great. So they're great. They're the exception that proves the rule. Yes. I've never actually understood that expression. The exception that proves the rule. How can, ex- how can an exception prove a rule? Surely it's the opposite. Um, surely it is. Yeah. You know, if, the ex- if it's an exception, it's not the rule. Anyway, pants. That, that example, Luke, was pants. Move on to the next one. Okay. Next one is the word par, which I never, ever use. So I, and par meaning a criticism or a, or disrespect. I never use this. I am much more likely to say dis as in disrespect. So let's replace the word par with the word dis instead. So a dis, it's a noun and it's a verb to dis someone and a dis, that is a disrespectful comment. So dis can also be a verb like you just got dissed. Um, you just, di- are you dissing me? Are you dissing me? Are you dissing my English? <laughs> Meaning, are you making fun of my English? Um, uh, it comes from the word disrespect or disrespected. Like, I don't mean this as a diss, but did you remember to wash this morning? For example, I don't think I would use it unironically. I'd only use it in an ironic sense because I'm not normally the sort of person who says diss. Are you dissing me? Uh huh. I'd probably say, are you are you making fun of me? Are you taking the piss out of me? Something like that. Right. Are you, are you, what are you saying? Are you disrespecting me? Excuse me, sir. Are you disrespecting me? I don't think I'd never have call to say it. Actually. I think he was being rude. He was being disrespectful. I would probably say it like that being disrespectful, but you might hear to diss someone. It's very common, terribly common. Next one is the word pear shaped like a pear, the fruit, right? A pear is a bit like an apple, but sort of with a, with a bit on the, with an extra bit. So like, though it's kind of round and fat at the bottom and it gets kind of thinner at the top, a pear. So if something's gone pear shaped, it's kind of gone the wrong shape. 
you might say. A situation which has quickly evolved into an accident waiting to happen. A situation that kind of goes wrong might be described as gone pear-shaped. The phrase is reportedly old slang from the Royal Air Force and was used to describe awry expeditions and flights. Flights or missions in the air that go wrong, like everything went pear-shaped. Well, this has all gone a bit pear-shaped, hasn't it? Uh, which is something that sometimes happens to me when I'm recording episodes of the podcast, especially when I'm like, oh my God, I'm quite tired. I ate a pear. A fun fact, listeners, I actually ate a pear before listening to this. I thought, I was actually faffing around uh, downstairs. And I was thinking, right, I've got to do an episode, got to do an episode. Come on, get it together. Stop faffing around. And then I decided I'd speak to myself in the voice of a posh gentleman. Now look here, you've got to stop faffing a bite and do the episode. Now, I suggest that you maybe eat some fruit in order to revitalize yourself, give yourself some energy. So I ate a pear, which I think is slight, it's just wearing off now. But um, anyway, arguably, this episode has gone a bit pear-shaped. Uh, or maybe not. Maybe you're thinking, no, Luke, don't say that about yourself. Everything's fine. We understand all of the examples you've given. You've managed to keep talking. Uh in a fairly coherent way for about 80 minutes. I think it's probably time we call the episode to a close, but still, there you go. An example. Simon, where have you been? Well, I went out to buy some milk last night, but uh, things, well, things got a bit pear-shaped and, well, I ended up, well, dropping into the pub for a few pints and it, well, I ended up drinking about nine and then it, it all went a bit pear-shaped and I ended up take, getting on the bus with uh, a mate of mine and then, um, well, things got a bit pear-shaped and, well, we ended up in um, Area 51 in the end. What? Yeah, it's, it, well, things got a bit pear-shaped and uh, we ended up getting abducted by aliens. What? No, no, I'm not accepting that as an, as an example. It was supposed to be a stupid situation where Simon goes out and the situation gets out of hand and he ends up getting abducted by aliens in Area 51. You know, I thought I could make a funny one out of that. But I've, as I said before, the episode's gone a bit pear-shaped. I'm too tired. Can you hear it in my voice? I've got a bit of a tight throat. I hope I'm not getting the lurgy. I hope not. Anyway, I'm going to stop here. I'm not going to do a recap because it will take too long. I'll just fly through them. Pear-shaped uh, to diss someone. Uh, pants, that was total pants. The episode was not total pants, Luke, okay? it's been a, It's been a good, strong episode, all right? Okay. All right. Don't over egg the pudding. Uh, what you want? You, you know, we went out on the pull last night. Did you, what did you pull? No, of course I didn't. You know, um, I'm on it. Don't worry. I've got it. I'm on it. Like a car bonnet. Pfft, I'd never say that. You know, did you just nick that banana? Watch out. You might get nicked. Uh, next one would be mint. Oh, these new shoes are mint. Look at that. They've done. They look great. Oh, I love your new shoes. They are mint. Uh, minging. Oh, I tell you what, I cooked, I cooked a uh, a pie yesterday, but it was absolutely minging. I think I put too much um, poo in it. What? Don't say that to the listeners. Then you're creating a horrible image. Sorry, Luke. That's minging. I apologise. Well, I'm a bit miffed now. Now that you put me off my dinner, hmm, a bit miffed. Um, Then we've got those words for being drunk, like trolleyed and smashed and sloshed and gazeboed. Thank you, Michael McIntyre. The lurgy, watch out. Make sure you wrap up warm. Get plenty of vitamin C during the winter months. You don't want to come down with the lurgy. Um, Leg it, quick. It's the cops. Leg it. Hello, hello, hello. What's going on here? Leg it. It's the cops. It's the old Bill. In it. Oh, that that was a wicked episode, in it. Do you have to do that accent, Luke? It's a bit insensitive. I'm sorry. There you go again, apologising. Don't do that. I'm all right. Jesus. This is just a little window into my head here. Anyway, Hank Marvin. I am absolutely Hank Marvin. After doing this long episode of the podcast, I am starving. I'm Hank Marvin. What time is it? It's quarter past five. I've got to go out in a minute. Um, and I've got to go and pick up my daughter from the creche. If if I didn't go and pick her up, she would be absolutely gutted. She'd be very upset, actually. If you don't pick up your child from the creche in France, you know what they do? They call the police. Yeah. For good reason. For good reason. Gobsmacked. I was absolutely gobsmacked when uh, that character died in that TV show. <laughs> gobsmacked. Um, 
And then, oh, gives a, gives a ring, gives a tinkle on the blower, I wouldn't say. All right, geezer, look at that geezer over there. For example, why? I don't know. He looks like he might do something interesting. Okay, let's keep watching him until he does something interesting. He's not going to do anything interesting. What are you talking about? He's just sitting there, smoking a fag. Uh, oh, well, off you go then. Off you go, gallivanting around London, having a fantastic time while I do all the work. You know, where do you want to do the podcast? My gaff, your gaff? Um, you're certainly full of beans this afternoon. I'll have the full Monty, please. The full English breakfast with all the trimmings. I'm trying to flog my, uh, uh, I'm trying to flog my arm. I've just, <laughs> I haven't got any money. I'm trying to flog my arm. What are you talking about? Sorry, it's a stupid example. I'm trying to flog my car. Okay, is that better? Okay, that's better, Luke. Keep it normal. Um, Oh, she's fit, isn't she? Sounds, it sounds wrong if you say that, if you're anything over about 35 years old, it just starts to sound creepy. But there it is. Um, <clears throat> fag, excuse me, mate, can I uh, scrounge a fag off you, please? Uh, excuse, do you have a spare f- cigarette? Have you got a spare fag? Um, to faff around. And that's where we started the episode, faffing around. And that is where we end. So I did actually do a little recap there at the end. Thank you for listening to this extra long episode. Um, No more faffing around here. I'm going to stop the episode. Thank you for listening. You'll find all of those words listed on the page for this episode on my website, teacherluke.co.uk, episode 625. So without further ado, I will now end the episode and uh, we will conclude this in part three. Thank you so much for listening. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you, you, everybody. And I'll speak to you on the podcast soon. Okay? Great. Bye bye for now then. Bye bye. Bye bye. Bye bye. bye. Thanks for listening to Luke's English Podcast. For more information, visit teacherluke.co.uk.